Hello, welcome everyone to F4S Digital Events, where we invite successful and inspiring speakers from the business world to tell their career story. In today's event, we explore careers in the engineering industry. I'm Kath, and I will be hosting today's session. For everyone watching, your audio, video and chat function has been disabled for safeguarding purposes. And if you are submitting questions, can you click the anonymous button? I do apologise in advance if we're unable to answer your questions today. We are recording the session and you will be able to watch again on YouTube and share with friends. So for now, sit back and enjoy the webinar, take some notes and get ready to ask some questions. I am delighted to welcome Brian Maguire, who will talk today about his career journey and the types of jobs available within the engineering industry. Brian, thank you for giving up your time today and for agreeing to share your story. Can you start by telling us about your career journey and what you have done since leaving school up until now? Sure. Firstly, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can all hear me clearly. Um, so, as I said, my name is Brian McGuire. I live in Glasgow, um, but I have lived in, in various countries and worked in various countries around the world. Um, I was very fortunate when I um, when I left school. I, I, I studied all of the standard things at school: physics, chemistry, maths, English, history. You know, um, not really sure what I wanted to do when I left school. Um, I actually left school, started a little business of my own, um, and then decided at that time the electronics industry in Scotland was was incredibly strong. Um, and it was actually quite easy. I managed to get a job with um, a company called Honeywell, still a massive company just now. They're based in the centre of Scotland. And at that time, they designed and built mainframe computers. Um, I went there, um, worked there. I had no post-school education at that point, but Honeywell were good enough to... Um, to fund me to go on and ultimately do a degree in electronics, a BSc in electronics, a further BSc in mechanical engineering, um, and, and beyond that, a master's in business admin. Now, that took me 12 years <laughs> because it's all part-time. You're working at the time. As I said, Honeywell were incredibly good to me in that they funded it, but all of the time had to come from my annual leave and you know, going to night schools and weekends and things like that. So, you know, I guess I guess the first lesson I learned is that, you know, I, I should have thought a lot more about it at school as to what I wanted to do post-school and gone straight on to university or college to study then. It would have been significantly easier and quicker to do it. Um, but, you know, I also think it, it teaches you a lesson, teaches you a lesson in hard work and, and how to organise and structure things. Um, and as I said... You know, what you will find is if you're willing to put the effort in, most employers are more than willing to back you up with, with time and effort and money to, to continue developing. I think one of the things that, that, that everybody on the call here will face is a very different environment to what I faced. Um, you know, basically back then you got a job and it lasted you all your life. I think the last statistics I saw suggested that the people who are going through university just now will probably not just have, I'm not talking about jobs here, I'm talking about different careers, will have three or four different careers before they finally stop working. Um, I've been fortunate in that I did that, but but it wasn't something I ever planned for, it wasn't something I needed to do. I could have stayed being an engineer all of my, all of my life. Um, I come from a very large family, seven sisters and two brothers. Um, went to, you know, some, I thought they were great schools, but they were very ordinary, comprehensive schools in, in Glasgow and in um, Lanarkshire. Um, you know, I, I, I did relatively well at school. Um, you know, it's a bit different up, uh, up in Scotland in terms of the qualifications, but I did six hires and two A-levels. Um, you know, uh, but but again, you know, didn't give enough thought when you look back now and didn't get enough guidance, quite frankly, from people who should have known better about, about what I should be focusing on post-school. Um, as, um, as I went to Honeywell, I was, um, 
I started as a, a test engineer. So my job in there was to, we, we manufactured all of the printed circuit boards to make the computers and all of the devices, the storage devices and the display devices and the communications devices. Somebody had to test them, debug them, make sure they worked and then build them up into, into fully blown computers. These are the days when a computer filled a large room rather than the laptops or the, the displays you're probably looking at just now. Um, so I, I worked hard at it, um, became a senior engineer with Honeywell, at which point they moved me into design, where they asked me to work on, on going across to the design centers in America, helping them finish the design of the product, bringing it back to Europe, to France, and to um, Scotland, and manufacturing them for the European market. Um, I mean, that was, that was a, a great job. Uh, very lucky to get that job. I got that job because I speak a little French. Um, and that we, we actually, the company was merged with a company called Group Bull, who's a big French techni technical company. And they needed people who spoke both French and English. Um, and believe it or not, in, um, in the whole of, uh, the whole of a factory of about 700 people at the time, there was two of us could speak, you know, any kind of any kind of decent French. Um, one of the points I'll make very strongly to you today is technology is important, but communication and languages are equally as important. And to have both of them in parallel is a massive, massive enabler for a for a great um, you know for a great career ahead of you. So I worked on my way through that. Um, I was at Honeywell for ten years. Um, well, I was at Honeywell for 11 years. That gave me the chance to, um, to finish all of my education, um, my, my master's degree. And then, you know, it became obvious that in order to grow into, you know, the, the, the kind of career that I wanted, I was going to have to change jobs and try something else. I moved to a company called Seagate Technology. We make storage products, um, disk drives, tape drives, things like that, solid state storage. Um, I joined them and I was in, in East Kilbride in Scotland. Um, I was the reliability and engineering manager. Um, you know, so I, I was responsible for making sure that all of the processes in the, in the factory were strong enough and reliable enough to build top quality products. Um, I had only been there a year when they decided to close all of their plants um, in, in Europe and transfer it across to Singapore. Um, but they asked me to stay on and to go to Amsterdam to build them a distribution center. So this was the first real change in my career where I moved from very, very technical design, electronics based working to firstly, project management in terms of building a new headquarters, um, and secondly, um, customer interface and distribution. So, so now, you know, I now had to learn a whole range of different skills in terms of planning, in terms of finance, um, to, to allow me to do this. And that was the first big change in my career. Um, I went across to Holland, my family, by this point I had, I was married with two kids. They came over and we lived in Holland for about eight years, which was a wonderful place to live. Um, towards the end of that time, um, I found I was spending more of my time in Asia because I was asked to, um, I was asked to go over there and work on the, the manufacturing sites over there, uh, helping them um, refine the processes and uh, every, everything we did over there. Manufacturing of something like a disk drive is extremely technical. You know, these things are spinning at 16,000 revs per minute, you know, and I mean, the gap between the head and the media, which is where, where you read it from, I mean, it's like one thousandth of a human hair, right? So this is, this is extremely technical things. So I went over there and spent quite a lot of time in Singapore and Malaysia and in Hong Kong. And then we decided that uh, we wanted to open factories in Mexico. Um, 
I was asked then to, to relocate to Mexico. Um, you know, Mexico is a wonderful place with wonderful people, but it's not a great place to live with a young family, to be honest, you know, if you're not Mexican. Um, so I, uh, I actually decided to live in South Texas, right on the Mexican border. And every day I traveled across into Northern Mexico. Um, built several factories there. By this time, we were moving a lot into robotics and the design of robotics. You know, so we built a factory there. That factory ended up being in total in various buildings over a million square feet with about 10,000 people. So um, I did that uh, up until 2002, at which point a company called Jabel, who's a contract manufacturer, and Jabel is a, is, a, is a type of company who um, doesn't have a brand of its own, but builds products for lots of other companies, you know, companies like Hewlett Packard, companies like Philips, companies like Apple, you know, anything these guys build nowadays, they tend to, to help somebody like Jabel design it, but Jabel manufactures it for it and puts their badges. So Jabel came down and bought the division that I was running for, for Seagate. I went across, became a Jabel employee. I moved from, from that position of running the plants down in Reynosa to being in charge of all of the operations in North, South and Central America. Um, so that was all of the technical side, all of the materials, all of the production, all of the distribution, um, everything really except finance and, and um, HR. So, uh, did that in 2006. We, we managed to build that business up from oh, about $40 million a year to about $400 million a year in revenue. Um, I was then asked in 2006 to build up the organization in Europe. I didn't relocate, um, but I took over the European operation. We built that up, um, sites in, in, in the UK, in Ireland, in Amsterdam, um, in Hungary, Poland, um, you know, all over Eastern Europe, Italy, France, and the West. Um, managed to build that business up very well, at which point I became the chief client officer of the whole organization. Um, so I was responsible for all sales, all business development, all account management. Um, you know, that went well to the point that in 2012, they asked me to become the chief executive officer. And the chief executive officer is, uh, is, is fundamentally responsible for everything. Um, one thing that became very obvious to me is that, you know, it made sense for the for Jabel to get out of that the business that I was running. So we decided to sell it, sold it to a private equity company, and formed formed a, a group called Icor, which I was the chief operating officer for a few years, and, and ran that. So uh, that really is you know, the, 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 the kind of journey I've had. A couple of things in it, three or four different careers, um, different doing different things. Key thing was the opportunity to live and work abroad. Um, you know, an absolutely massive opportunity and something that that's, that's going to seem very, very normal to the people on this call as their career develops because it's becoming such a massive international economy. So I don't know if you want me to get through couple of slides because I've spoken about a lot of what's on the, on the slides, Kath. Do you just want me to carry on? Or um, you yeah, if you miss, you, you've, you've got another, I mean, there are some questions coming in, but if you want to run through them, you've got another six minutes or so before we need to. Okay, so, so, so I mean, the first slide I put up here, kind of, just talks a wee bit more about me. This one is titled Business Awareness, but it's just to give you an idea, it, it astounds me how little we prepare our young people about what a business organization looks like. You know, I mean, people think, oh, if you're an engineer, you, you stand, you make things, you fix things, you design things, right? You know, um, but, but it's a very, very complicated thing. If you look at having the CEO at the top, you've got operations, which is the traditional factories with production control and supply chain and capacity planning, engineering, all of those facilities there require a strong engineering background. You know, it's not always, you know, building engines or, 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 or creating computers. It can be creating systems. It can be, it can be qualifying suppliers to supply products to you. 
you know, in sales, once you get into sales, when you're out selling for a technical company, I found the best sales guys come from an engineering background. So I think the point I'm making here without, without going through every single one of these is that engineering positions you to, to, to have a job and, and to perform in a lot of different areas in a, in a modern organization. Um, you know, whether it's IT, which is the, the, the computer provisioning, you know, whether it's customer interface, there's a, there's a job called a solutions engineer. A solutions engineer will go out and speak to customers, find out what the customer needs, come back, work out, can we do it, help price the product, and then communicate with the customer. So it's more of a sales organization, but from a very technical perspective. You know, so when you're doing... I mean, uh, if you decide to do engineering, you know, make sure that, that, that you, don't, you don't make it too narrow and too specific. You know, there's, a, there's an absolutely tremendous um, course that goes on at a place called Strathclyde University here in Glasgow called Mechatronics. And Mechatronics is a mixture of electronics, mechanical engineering and robotics and that type of thing, that kind of background. Even if you don't end up building a single robot in your life, I mean, the kind of knowledge that you get from that, that I know because my nephew's on it, you know, and he's just spent a year in Singapore as part of his course, you know. So so look for these courses that are broad, look for these courses that allow, if if it makes sense to you, for for some uh, some international travel and, um, and, and training, and, and you'll find just positioning yourself for jobs that you don't even know exist at this point. Some of the key trends that you're going to keep an eye on, I mentioned globalization. I mentioned language and accent, which for some of us on, on, on the call today is, is a big, big deal. I've actually been away, believe it or not, in an language, a language, an accent reduction program. My company paid 40,000 US dollars for me to lose my, my Glasgow accent. And as you can probably tell, you know, I, I, I it did become different for a little while, but the more time I spend back in Glasgow, I'm afraid the, the broader it becomes. But but it's absolutely key. I, I would find, I, I had at one point 14 factories in China that all reported to me. Um, and I would go on telephone calls with them and we would talk about something that had to happen. Um, you know, we'd be as clear as we could. Um, and then, I would leave the call, travel out there in four weeks' time, and nothing that I had asked for had happened. And the problem was they didn't understand what I was saying. And culturally, the Chinese people, you know, find it very difficult to, to, to interrupt you, you know, to, 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 to ask for clarification, you know. So it wasn't their fault. It was my fault, my accent is very strong and difficult to understand for a Chinese person. Um, it was my responsibility for me to be clear, you know, but, but we wasted a lot of time and effort and money. So certainly anyone from Scotland listening, and I'm a proud Scottish person, you know, language and accent is important. Mobility, absolute key, but the willingness to, to work abroad, the willingness to work in different areas. It's becoming a knowledge economy. People are going to pay you for what you know rather than what you do. And that's strange, I mean, but that's away from physically building widgets now to advising people on the best way to build them, the best markets to sell them and how to price them. Biotechnology and alternative energy are absolutely massive, uh, particularly up here in Scotland, but throughout the United Kingdom. Um, you know, for biotech, chemistry and biology, but with an engineering aspect to it are absolutely massive. Then obviously physics and mechanics for alternative energy. And then finance, whatever you do, if you have an option of taking a language course and a finance course, take it because they, uh, it helps you understand why you're doing certain things in your business. Um, you know, it took me 10, 15 years to waken up to that fact, but, um, but many of the courses that, that, that you go to do just now will let you do electives and things like finance or, or, or marketing or, or even music, believe it or not. 
Uh, you know, the kind of final message quickly, and then we can do whatever questions you have is, you know, I didn't come from a particularly special or privileged background, you know, and a lot of people, uh, uh, you know, this sounds a little bit cruel, but a lot of people use that as a reason not to push themselves, right? I mean, fundamentally, if I can do it, anybody can do it. Numeracy is key, right? You know, I just, I have a granddaughter now and I sit and it just worries me that, you know, that, um, that she struggles a little bit with numeracy because it doesn't matter what you're doing in the future, you're going to, you're going to struggle. But in terms of be, be ready for change, be happy to move abroad, to live abroad, to do different jobs, learn different languages, learn different things. You know, when you're picking what you want to do just now, try and think 10 years ahead, something you would want to do, right? Um, and also think about when it comes to looking for a job, why should somebody pick you other than somebody else with exactly the same qualifications? You know, what do you have that's different? How about you going to stand out in the crowd? And a lot of that goes back to perhaps having done, you know, a finance course or perhaps having done something different. But think about how you're going to differentiate yourself. And you're going into a life of, of risk and challenge here. Don't be worried about it. Look out for it. Because if you're successful in that, that will give you the opportunities that I've been lucky enough to have and to move forward. So I think with the timing, I should probably stop wittering on here and uh, see, if there, see if there are any questions, Kath, that yep. I, can, okay. I can take. So the first one is, and I mean, you mentioned that when you, you went straight into a job, you didn't go to university first and you carried on studying afterwards. So the first question is, is it best to get an apprenticeship or go to university? So that's, a, that's, a, that's a tremendous question. Um, you know, I'll be honest, I, I, I think about it a lot. Um, if I was doing it again, what would I do? Um, you have to be careful and uh, I'll have educators screaming at me here. Some of the apprenticeships out there just now are not great, right? So the right apprenticeship, the right technical apprenticeship that allows you to study along with it, you know, that truly trained you in something. And uh, another one of my nephews just did one in um, graphic design, which has been a tremendous apprenticeship. And um, he actually quit university to go into this apprenticeship. Um, now, at some point, he'll go back and, 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 and he will study, he will do a master's in something. But um, it, it depends. You know, there are some people who, are, who need to be their own boss because they don't work well in teams. For me, doing an apprenticeship positions you to have your own business at an earlier stage, but it may restrict you from how far you can go, how high you can go without those formal qualifications. So um, it's unfortunate I can't give you a, a straight answer on that. If you ask me to plump, I would say get the education first, right? I mean, if, if you're unsure, go to college and do it first, um, you know, because it's going to position you and you might discover something at college that you the, the, the you decide is, is more appropriate for you. Okay, so throughout your career, you have seen a huge amount of change. Um, you, you talked about computers being the size of a room, um, and you're right through now to robotics and mechatronics and biotechnology and alternative energy. So someone is asking what type of engineering is best for them to study? What is when you give them a career for the future? So again, I would look at if there was two specific, or three, let me say, I'd look at biotechnology, um, which is a mixture of chemistry and engineering. Um, I'd look at, at, at medical-based technology. You know, the, I mean, everyone's heard, unfortunately, over the last three months about, you know, trying to find ventilators and all of the equipment that have, that's been used in the in the, in the fight against COVID, you know, the people who build and design that massive companies like Philips Medical Systems, Siemens Medical Systems. Um, you know, I worked for a while with these guys when they were designing MRI machines. Uh, and that's a, that is a, an area which is going to continue developing and growing. And then alternative energy, you know, whether it be wind, wave, solar, whatever. We all know that carbon-based energy is, is, is not the future for us. Um, and, and, and those are the areas. So, so all of them, I would say in terms of that, this, this thing I spoke about, mechatronics, 
will position you for three or four or five, six different industries. So if you can find a course that mixtures the, 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 the combines mechanics and electronics, um, I, would, I would strongly advise you to look very closely at that. Okay. So again, you spoke about when you were at school, you didn't really know what you wanted to do when you were there. And I think that is um, a very, very common issue uh, mm -hmm. for students these days. And if someone's asking if they choose to study a particular kind of engineering, but then want to change at a later date through university, is it easy enough or, or even yeah. in their career, is it easy enough for them to swap? Yeah, yeah, largely it is, right? You know what I mean? When you go look at engineering courses, the first couple of years are pretty standard, to be honest. Um, you know, the, the mathematics and things like that are the same for for lots of different engineerings, you know, so so you'll get at least a year at university, possibly two years, depending if you're doing a three or four year degree, you know, of, of kind of standard basics, at which point you're kind of educating yourself. It's always easier to study something that you like than something you don't like because, and I've done it when it comes to a wet Tuesday night in November, you know, and you have to get your head down into the books, it's much, much easier for something which doesn't absolutely appall you <laughs> some of which did for me right you know but uh so try and find something that you have a passion for that you have an interest in that that really makes you think deeply um but you'll have the first 12 to 24 months at university really doing fairly standard stuff you know with the opportunity to, to switch courses once you finish university it's absolutely up to you how, how, how much effort how much time how much money uh, not not so much money, but how much effort, how much time do you want to put in to learning new things? Because as an employer, I will, you know, I, I, I don't know. I must have, I must have paid for hundreds and hundreds of masters and doctorates because someone who works for me has come and said, listen, this is something, you know, um, statistics um, is a massive thing just now, right? And, uh, and I had people come to me saying, listen, I want to go and do a master's in statistics because we can do the planning much better than the company wants to do. So, so people are more than happy to help you, to accommodate you in your job, and, and quite frankly, to contribute financially towards it. So whether you can change after you've, you've done your degree is absolutely down to how much hard work you want to put into it. Okay. Um, and that kind of brings us on then to another one. That somebody's asking is it hard to work and study at the same time incredibly hard um and it's one of these things when you look back at it you wonder how you did it i i mentioned you know during the time when when i was doing it part-time um i had two young kids as well right now we didn't have a lot of money at that time either and because i was studying i couldn't work overtime so so i, I don't know why my wife stuck around with me to be brutally frank right because she hardly saw anything of me. I was poor, we had a horrible car, right? You know, and she had the kids screaming all day while I was I was up in libraries trying to study. Um, it's, it's very difficult. You need to be very disciplined. You need to be very focused, have a plan and stick to it. Um, but it can be done, you know, and, 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 and the satisfaction you get at the end of it, Kath, is phenomenal. I mean, standing next to, you know, I was standing next to kids who had done a four year degree and thinking, Wow, you don't, you know, I mean, I deserve this so much more than you because I had to put so much more into it, right? So, yeah, it, it can be done, but it is incredibly difficult. Don't take this as me recommending this is the way you should do it, but take it from me from saying, if you start something and you don't like it, there's always other paths to make it happen, right? So, so don't ne never, never get dispirited because your first path doesn't work out for you. You know, it's just a, a different way of doing it. Okay. We've got quite a few girls watching today and there's one question, well there's two questions but they're both in the same, um, from, from the same person. So how many girls are in engineering and how easy is it for girls to get a job? It's, it's different now, right? Heavy engineering, heavy mechanical engineering, which can tend to have, you know, a very kind of physical aspect to it and, and, and things like that. It's, it's slower. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of ladies in, in, in design. There's a lot of ladies in, um, in biotech and medical and electronics now. Um, it's nowhere near 50-50 yet. 
But uh, you know, when I when, when I was when I was going through my career, you know, I think I met one female electronics engineer in thirty years. Right now, you know, when we are hiring people just now, you know, and we hire hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people, um, you know, we are, we are probably hiring from an engineering perspective. Forty percent of the people we hire will be female now. Yeah. Um, some countries in the world. I mean, Mexico, I mean, I, I bet 70% of them are female. This is it's amazing, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, but, but this country, I mean, engineering still has a little bit of an image issue in, in, in this country in terms of it's a boy's thing, right? And, 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 and females should go do finance or law or teaching or something like that. But there's absolutely no reason and there's plenty of jobs and employers are looking for female engineers. Because having that balance, you know, the different sexes in your organization mm -hmm. is absolutely massive because like at Olympic, there are things that women are more intuitively better at than men, right? Yeah. Okay. And because but, I have seven sisters, I need to say that. Right? Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess you were you had equality all your life anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. So thank you, Brian, for sharing your story. And I'm sure those oh. watching today will have a bit of a better idea of what it's like to be an engineer. I want to thank everyone that has joined us today, especially as it's so nice and sunny outside. Thank you for giving up some time. Um, you will all be emailed a feedback survey, so please complete this so that we can continue to improve our digital services. Um, you can look out for this recording on our YouTube channel, Founders for Schools. And if you aren't already following us, we are on Twitter and Instagram. So please share these with your friends and family. Our next career session is tomorrow at 2.30pm and we'll focus on the importance of maths. So Brian again, thanks very much and thank you to everyone and hopefully we'll see you all in another session. Thank you. Good luck everybody.